Brothers and sisters in Christ, Proverbs 26, verse 11, it says that as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. If you, ever, if you have ever watched and discussed as you see a dog return to its own vomit to, to sniff it and then, and then to lick it up, you'll understand that this proverb becomes as a sharp rebuke. Because do we not all struggle with recurring folly, the repeated sins of our lives? When you fall into sin, has your conscience ever accused you? You are a sinner, a repeat offender. Day after day, week after week, you serve not God, but yourself. You disrespect your parents repeatedly. You are continually engaging in pornography or drunkenness. Your recurring anger, envy, gossiping. It makes you a repeat offender. How can you even call yourself a child of God, one of his people, when you keep plunging into repeated sin? How terrible it is, brothers and sisters, to struggle with an accusing conscience, to question whether God will actually be gracious to repeated sinners and offenders. But congregation, God's word also brings hope It brings hope for us who repeatedly fall into sin and temptation. There is hope for repeat sinners like us because God has appointed a high priest, Jesus Christ, who deals with the problem of our sins in full. This morning we will see God's wrath. We will see the punishment of death that our sins deserve. But we will also see the incredible grace of God bestowed upon us in Christ, who is foreshadowed by the high priest Aaron in number 16. This morning I bring to you God's word under this theme. Let us marvel at the high priest who stands between the dead and the living. Let us marvel at the high priest who stands between the dead and the living. As we stand marveling at our high priest, let's do so in three different ways. First of all, let us be thankful for the appointment of our high priest. Second of all, let us trust in the work of our high priest. And finally, let us also delight in the character of our high priest. So first of all, as we marvel at our high priest, let us be thankful that God has appointed a high priest for us. Congregation, Numbers 16, it contains some difficult information to process, doesn't it? You might be wondering, how, how should this story influence our understanding of who God is? Because some people, they look at Israel's sin of grumbling in verse 41, and then how God killed 14,700 of them with the plague. And they, they decide that God is vindictive, that he is unjust, and that he is overreacting. But is this true, brothers and sisters? No. These people, they misunderstand two absolutely vital points. These points we're going to be looking at throughout our first uh, point of our sermon Two points, they they misunderstand the seriousness of Israel's sin. They also misunderstand the incredible grace of God, that he was actually the one who appointed the high priest to deal with the problem of Israel's sin. Now, in order that we don't also misunderestimate the severity of Israel's sin, let's just zoom out, Let's, let's, let's step back and consider the overall picture, God's overall plan of salvation. After mankind fell into sin, as you know, God had a plan to rescue his people and to establish his kingdom on earth once again. It involves establishing his kingdom, it involves choosing a people for himself. But congregation, establishing his kingdom also involves the destruction of all God's enemies. 
That's why God promised in Genesis 3 that he was going to put, to put enmity, to put separation between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. It's why God promised that he was going to crush the head of Satan. When we pray, your kingdom come, in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, our catechism, it teaches us that we are asking that God would destroy the works of the devil, that he would destroy every power that raises itself against you, that God would destroy every conspiracy against his holy word. God's kingdom, it advances through warfare. The congregation understanding this, that God's kingdom advances through warfare. Let's now begin to zoom in to the book of Numbers. I invite you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 1. Numbers 1. If you were to skim over this chapter real quick, you would see that it has a a long list of, of names and numbers. And congregation, when we come to these different passages during our personal devotion, sometimes we can wonder, how do we, how do we receive spiritual nourishment from, from a passage like this? Well, congregation, this is no random list. If you look at verse 3, it says that this list numbers from 20 years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war. This is a census numbering every person that was able to fight on behalf of God. If you turn to chapter 2, it's entitled Arrangement of the Camp. And you might be thinking, well, this is, what, 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 is, what is this? It looks like uh, an unimportant list of where people are supposed to set up their camps, their, their tents, and, and sleep. Until you realize that God is arranging his war camp. We know from ancient documents that Israel's camp described here in in chapter 2, it closely mirrors the Egyptian war camp. Just as the description here in Numbers 2, Egypt's camp had the king, the commander of the army, was encamped in the center. And on all four sides, his army was encamped around him. Exactly what Numbers 2 describes. Which means that Israel is preparing for battle. Holy God is at the center of the war camp and he is drawing up battle plans against the Canaanites, the seed of the serpent. God is working to establish his kingdom on earth. Perhaps you have wondered how God could command genocide in the Bible, how he could command the Israelites to, to utterly wipe out all of the Canaanites How how could a a just and loving God do that? Well, congregation, it's not genocide per se that God commands. No, it's sin, O side. God is a holy warrior, and he is on a mission to utterly annihilate all sin and wickedness. At lunchtime, if you want, you can go home and, and read about mission accomplished where God succeeds in destroying all wickedness from Revelation 19. Revelation 19, the second half of the chapter, describes how Jesus is going to return as a holy warrior to utterly wipe out all sin and evil. Now, if God is on a mission to wipe out all wickedness in order to establish his kingdom on earth for his holy people, Congregation, this means that participation in God's army, it requires Israel to also be holy warriors. They must be sanctified soldiers. But what happens? Well, you might know the story. And if you turn to Numbers 14, it begins to describe it. Israel is marching towards Canaan and they're on the brink of war, but they fail to trust in the Lord, their commander. Instead, they listen to the report of the 12 spies and and they rebel against God's chief generals. Numbers 14, verse 2, it says that all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron. In fact, if you read through Numbers 14, grumbling is mentioned no less than six times. Verse 27, in verse 27, God asks, 
How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? And maybe you remember what happens after that. God disciplines his unruly army, condemning everyone 20 years old old and older to die in the wilderness over 40 years. And yet, God's army rebels once again. Number 16, it describes that how Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, how they're angry with Moses and Aaron. And they assemble 250 of the leading Israelites and challenge their authority. Congregation, this is actually a, a, a two-pronged rebellion. Two separate rebellions that happen at the same time. It's a coordinated attack. In verses 3 to 11, Korah takes 250 chiefs of the congregation. And these were well-known men. Humanly speaking, these were men that had the power to, to turn God's people against him. And they challenge Aaron as the high priest. But congregation, it's not ultimately Aaron's authority that they're rebelling against, is it? We see what Moses says in verse 11. It is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron? Indeed, what is Aaron? It's against God that they're rebelling. In verse 7, 11, it ends by saying that they grumble once again. Then verses 12 through 15, Dathan and Abiram, they, they challenge and they mock Moses. They take Moses' words that were, we read in verse 9. Is it too small a thing for you? Is it too small a thing for you? They take these words, they, they twist them, exactly what Satan likes to do, and they spit these words back in Moses' face. Verse 13. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? That you must also make yourself a prince over us? In other words, you know what, Moses? We'd rather be back in Egypt, back in slavery, serving Satan and being a part of his people than being part of God's army and submitting to you as his appointed leader. Dear brothers and sisters, do you see now the severity of their sin? In World War II, when the Allies caught a traitor or turncoat, they executed him. Swift justice was meted out to anyone trying to undermine king or country. By rebelling against Moses and Aaron, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they are committing high treason against the Lord. And God responds appropriately. As all the people stand there watching, the, the earth, it, it opens its mouth and it consumes the rebels alive. They descend into the ground, kicking and screaming at the top of their lungs. And then, silence. But God isn't done yet. Like a drone strike, God executes with fire those 250 men that were not authorized to offer incense. All Israel flees with terror at God's righteous judgment. Congregation, I want you to imagine for a moment the shock, the grief, and the wailing that must have been heard in Israel's camp that day, that evening. They must have been completely devastated. And you'd think that they would have understood just a little bit more about God's holiness and the seriousness of their sin. But in verse 41, we read that on the next day, all the congregation of the people of Israel, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Again, a repeated rebellion only a day after the Lord quashed the last one. This is the last straw. God tells Moses in verse 45, get away from the midst of this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. 
And Moses said to Aaron, take your censer, put fire on it from off the altar and lay incense on it. Carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Congregation, the word translated wrath in our text is usually wrath that is executed in a battlefield. And we have to pause here to note something important. Because God has a zero toleration policy for sin in his holy army. Sin makes God's people into his enemies and they suffer his warlike wrath. When Israel rebels, they are fighting for Satan. Isaiah 63, it it speaks of Israel at a different time. And it says that they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy. And he himself fought against them. Brothers and sisters, in one way or another, sin must be purged from God's army. Maybe you have heard or sang these words before. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Or how about onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before? These songs, they remind us of the truth of Scripture. That we also, as members of this church, as members of God's people, we have been enlisted in God's holy army to fight against sin and against Satan. But what happens when we fall into sin, especially into repeated rebellion against God. Israel's grumbling, a sin that we might not even consider to be that bad, it received capital punishment. In the mere minutes it takes Aaron to get his staff, 14,700 of the Israelites perish under God's terrible wrath. Congregation, I must ask you, Do you find your sins as offensive as God does? The way you bicker with or nitpick your spouse or your children. Your bitterness. How about the delight that you take in gossip? Do you believe what God's word says about the offensiveness of your sins? It might be counterintuitive at first because how our sinful nature blinds us. But congregation, we must let God's word, we must let passages like number 16 shape how we think about the seriousness of our sins, about God's holiness. Our catechism, which faithfully summarizes the Bible's teachings, it explains that God is terribly angry with our sins. Therefore, he will punish them by a just judgment, both now and eternally. Even, even our so-called respectable sins, you, you, you know, I, I shouldn't be doing that, but it's not that bad, is it? Even our respectable sins put us in the enemy camp, doomed to perish under God's heavy wrath. Like Israel, we need rescuing. Brothers and sisters, our text is not just a warning about God's wrath. It also contains one of the most beautiful messages that the Bible has about God's grace. Because us dying is not the only way for sin to be purged from God's army. Our text, it goes on to say at the end of verse 47, that Aaron put on the incense and made atonement for the people. It says that Aaron stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stopped. 
a congregation, this is the answer. This is the answer to anyone who thinks that God is a harsh or vindictive judge. Because the high priest, it it wasn't Moses' idea. It was God's idea. God appointed Aaron to be the high priest because he knew in advance that his people were going to sin, that they were going to need intercession. God's grace made salvation possible for Israel even before the sin of our text. And God has also provided, he has planned a way of escape for us from eternity past. Because God knew already then how prone we would be to rebel and sin against him. 1 Peter 1 verse 19 through 20, it says that Christ, the lamb without spot or blemish, that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Congregation, God knew even before the world was created that we would sin and he appointed Christ. Praise be to God that he has provided Christ to be our high priest, to intercede for us, to provide atonement for our sins. Because God wants everyone to turn to him and live, there is a way of escape. Salvation is possible through the high priest. But brothers and sisters, Your salvation depends on your relationship with that high priest. I draw your attention back to verse 48. It says in verse 48 that Aaron stood between the dead and the living. The high priest, he he literally divided Israel in two. Those who perished and those who who lived. And so I must ask you, on what side of the great high priest are you living today? Because brothers and sisters, one day it will be too late to change sides. Matthew 25, it says that when Christ returns, he's going to separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Matthew 25 says that he's going to place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. But he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Brothers and sisters, if you are standing in a wrong relationship with Jesus, if you are living in unrepentant sin and have not embraced Jesus as your high priest and savior, repent. Repent now. The wrath of God, it hangs over you otherwise, ready to fall. There is only one way to escape God's wrath. Just as the only Israelites who survived the plague of of God's wrath. They they were protected by Aaron's atoning incense. So also, Jesus' sacrifice, it only protects those who believe in him. So brothers and sisters, repent of your sinful lifestyle. Turn to Jesus in faith. Trust in him for your salvation. Trust in the work that he has accomplished. The work that he also is still doing on your behalf. Congregation, we are going to now shift back to our text in our second point to see how Aaron's actions as, as Israel's high priest, how they help us to trust in Christ's work, his actions as our high priest. Aaron, he does as Moses commands. You see in in the verses 46 and 47 that Aaron runs to the altar. In one hand, he takes his censer, which was like a a small shovel or or a frying pan. He scoops some coals out of the bronze altar. 
grabs some incense in the other hand, and then he runs to make atonement for God's people. Now, what do we know about incense? Well, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest came directly into the Holy of Holies. He appeared in the presence of God. And as he appeared in God's presence, the high priest had to offer incense, which was filled with coals taken from the altar. I want you to take note of this. That protective incense that caused Aaron not to die immediately in God's presence. It was burned on coals that had been taken from the sacrificial altar. Coals that had already had a sacrificial animal burnt on them. That is the first thing that we know about incense. The second thing that we know about incense comes from Psalm 141, which we sang from earlier. We sang, let my prayers like incense rise. Incense is like prayer. It rises to the Lord. It it seeks his favor. And it also intercedes on behalf of believers. Okay, you might be wondering. Incense both protects and incense is like prayer. But how does incense make atonement for the Israelites? Shouldn't Moses have commanded Aaron in our text? Quick, find a bull and sacrifice it on the altar to make atonement for the people. After all, didn't God say in Leviticus 17 verse 11 that it is the blood that makes atonement? How could could Moses have commanded this? Well, in my research on this passage, every suggested answer it involves a degree of speculation because our text it simply doesn't reveal why Moses gave Aaron this command but I believe that the best explanation is that God directly speaks to Moses and gives these instructions for Aaron why because there simply isn't time to make another sacrifice people are dying so Aaron takes the coals of a sacrifice from the altar coals from a sacrifice that was already made. And what happens? Verse 47. He put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stopped. Just like that. Immediately. Our text doesn't say that the plague, it it gradually creeped to a halt. No. Aaron runs directly into the path of the destroyer and instantly the plague stops. The dead on one side of of Aaron, the living on the other. God immediately accepts Aaron's intercession. That sweet smelling incense, it, it rises from the sacrificial coals. It enters into God's nostrils and immediately appeases his wrath. Congregation, what an incredible picture this is of our great high priest, Jesus. Because sometimes we forget that his high priestly work, that it did not end on the cross. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, the verses 24 through 25. In Hebrews 7, verses 24 to 25, we see that Christ's high priestly work, it goes on now that he has ascended into heaven. We read, But Jesus holds his his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Why? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession for them. Congregation, Christ made atonement for our sins with his blood on the cross once for all. But Christ, he continues to apply his atonement to us. I'm going to say that again. Christ made atonement for us. He made satisfaction for our sins once for all on the cross. 
but he continues to apply his atonement, to apply his satisfaction to us in heaven. In a similar way that Aaron burned incense on coals from the sacrificial altar, so Christ burns incense on the coals of his completed sacrifice. Christ's incense is his prayers that he offers to God on behalf of his people. On the basis of his perfect and completed sacrifice, Jesus calls upon the Father to have mercy on us always because his death is sufficient to appease all of God's wrath. And God delights. He delights to listen to Christ's intercession immediately, just like he accepted Aaron's atoning incense. But congregation, because Christ is divine, his intercessory work, it far exceeds Aaron's. As God, our our high priest is also God. As God, Christ is able to pray for and to intercede for every believer by name, every moment of every day. Congregation, if you remember nothing else from the sermon this morning, please remember this. Right now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And he is praying for you, for me, and for believers throughout this world. He is able to do so as almighty God. What an incredible comfort we have. If Satan himself is attacking you, trying to cause you to fall away, to fall away from believing in God, he can accomplish nothing. In Luke 22, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But Jesus goes on to say, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And though he was tempted severely, Simon Peter, he persevered. His faith, he persevered in his faith because he had a high priest in Jesus. A high priest atoning, for, interceding for him. Brothers and sisters, if you have a high priest in Jesus, you have a guarantee of your perseverance in faith because he always lives to intercede for you. What an awesome high priest we have. When your faith is shaken to its very core, when you lose a loved one or suffer a miscarriage, when you lose your job and you can't pay the bills, Christ is praying for you. He is there at his Father's hand saying, Father, you know what she is going through right now. You know her struggles. Give her faith to persevere. Hold her tight in your loving arms and don't ever let go. And our God listens immediately. Just like he accepted Aaron's atoning incense immediately. But what about when I fall into sin? What about when I fall into that repeated sin? the one I simply can't seem to overcome. Brothers and sisters, this might be one of the most beloved truths of our passage. When Israel repeated its sin of grumbling, almost 15,000 people died under God's heavy wrath before Aaron was able to atone for them. And when when we sin, especially that sin that we are ashamed of, do we not sometimes tremble that God might unleash his fierce wrath upon us. Know this. You have a high priest. And unlike Aaron, he doesn't have to first go run to find his censor. Even in the moment as you are falling into sin, Christ is praying for you. Yes, Father, this child of yours is sinning. Yes, He deserves your wrath because of his sins. 
But Father, remember why you sent me into the world. Remember my sacrifice, which I accomplished for him, because he believes in me. Wash away also this sin. And just as Aaron's incense protected the people and immediately appeased God's wrath, so also, when you believe in Jesus, God delights to immediately answer Christ's prayers. He will never pour out his wrath against you because of your sins when you have a high priest in Christ. And it is with this confidence that we are now privileged in the power of the Holy Spirit to fight against our repeated sins. Because Christ is our high priest, the battle is not hopeless. God is not angry with those who believe in Christ. So rely on him. Trust in him entirely for your complete salvation, also your perseverance in faith. And be consoled that you have a high priest who never sleeps or slumbers. He always lives to intercede for us. And congregation, having Christ as our high priest, it gets even better. We've seen how as repeat offenders, we act as God's enemies and we must either be destroyed or atoned for. We've also seen how God has mercifully provided a high priest who deals with the problem of sin in full. And we also trust in Christ's ongoing high priestly work for our complete salvation. But as we turn back to our text in number 16 to look at Aaron one last time, we will also see that we can delight in the character of our high priest. This is our final point. Our text is one of Aaron's best moments. A moment where he most closely portrays the character of Jesus. Because, brothers and sisters, in our text, Aaron is loving, long-suffering, and also self-sacrificing. God has just told Moses and Aaron in verse 45 to get away from the midst of this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. What a love Aaron shows for his people congregation. Not only does Aaron not withdraw himself, Not only does he, in fact, move towards God's people, but he runs. Aaron runs. So deep is his love for God's people. Aaron is an old man, probably well over 100 by the time of our text, and he runs. So deep is his love for the Israelites, this bunch of rebels. Because that's who the Israelites are. They're rebels, repeat offenders. Earlier in Numbers 14, they had wanted to stone Aaron and Moses. And now they again assemble against Moses and against Aaron. This is a hostile confrontation. But rather than abandoning them, Aaron is patient. He is long-suffering. He loves the Israelites, even though they have conspired against him again and again. In fact, Aaron loves them so much that he risks his own life to save theirs. Aaron runs. He stands, um, so to speak, on the, on the front line, directly in the path of the destroyer. He endangers his own life to save those who are in rebellion against him. What a self-sacrificial love Aaron displays. And can you begin to see the character of our great high priest, Jesus, coming through. Aaron runs to the Israelites in love. Our high priest demonstrates his love in an even more miraculous way. The almighty son of God loved us by by humbling himself, by emptying himself and forsaking his glory, by being born as a helpless baby. That's how much our savior loved us. Like Aaron, Christ came to his own people, yet his own did not receive him, but rejected and despised him. Christ came into this world knowing that he was going to be killed by the very people he had come to save. He came knowing that he was going to suffer God's devastating wrath 
so repeat sinners and offenders like you and me could be saved. Brothers and sisters, that is your awesome high priest. Let us delight in him and give him our utmost praise and thanksgiving. His self-sacrificial love has brought us from death to life. As you go about your life this week, remember, remember Aaron running to stop the plague. Take courage in how God immediately accepted Aaron's atoning uh, incense, how he turned away his wrath immediately. And finally, and most importantly, remember how much greater your high priest Jesus is. Not a moment goes by that your loving high priest does not personally and powerfully pray on your behalf. What a glorious high priest we have, brothers and sisters. Praise God that he has provided Christ to atone for the sins of repeat sinners and offenders like you and like me. Amen.